With Mayor Mike Bloomberg's recent announcement that he has left the Republican Party, speculation has been fueled that he might run as an independent. And pundits and voters, particularly those on the Democratic side, are scrambling to see what effect Mr. Bloomberg might have on the 2008 presidential election. Hailing from the hometown of the front-running Democratic candidate, Senator Hillary Clinton, and popular among her voters, would he pull New York State out of the Democratic Electoral College column, holding the same job as another possible Republican contender, Rudy Giuliani? Could he, as a recent Quinnipiac poll showed, dampen the Giuliani vote in a race between Hillary Clinton, Bloomberg, and Giuliani, and boost Hillary Clinton in New Jersey? And what if the Republicans don't nominate Giuliani, and what if the Democrats nominate Barack Obama or Edwards? With all these calculations and speculations, it might be comforting to know that even Abraham Lincoln at one time engaged in similar perplexing political calculations. Yes, before he had his own presidential ambitions, Lincoln had campaigned for Whig presidents, President Harrison and Zachary Taylor. And now, as a newly minted Republican in 1856, Lincoln was working in Illinois with efforts to elect James Fremont, the first Republican presidential candidate. The problem the new Republican Party faced and Lincoln faced was not only in James Buchanan, who was the Democratic nominee, who enjoyed the overwhelming support of the South, as well as his home state of Pennsylvania. And in 1856, that made for a formidable combination in the Electoral College. Given the states available in the Electoral College, the Republicans could not allow Buchanan to win one more northern state. One more northern state other than his home state of Pennsylvania, and Buchanan would become president. So Illinois was up for grab, and attention focused there. But the true problem was not just in Buchanan, but that the race had become a three-way. The vice president under Whig President Zachary Taylor, who had become president upon his death, was Millard Fillmore, and he disappointed Whigs with some of his policies. But Fillmore still had his followers, particularly among the anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, so-called know-nothing groups. He was running for president on the American National Union, sometimes called Know-Nothing Party. Disappointingly for Lincoln, Fillmore was also, like Fremont, against the expansion of slavery, which was the Republicans' main issue. The problem with the Fillmore people, Lincoln said, is that they say our man is just as much against the expansion of slavery as yours. And when you say that is not so, they think it's an attack on Fillmore. Lincoln's complaint echoes what a Gore supporter may have said about Nader in 2000, or what a Democrat may be posting today on a blog about Bloomberg. Don't waste your vote. Don't elect your enemy. But Lincoln, in his logical genius, took it all one step further. He crafted a form letter that he himself mailed to anyone supporting Fillmore, who lived in Illinois. And it was a lithographed form letter, so he would merely put the date and put the name of the person he was addressing it to and get it in the mail. That way he could get the maximum amount out. The message, Lincoln said, if you vote for Fillmore, you're voting against Fillmore. It was an argument only the supreme master of logic Abraham Lincoln could make. Dear sir, he said, I understand you're a Fillmore man. Let me prove to you that every vote withheld from Fremont and given to Fillmore in this state, the state of Illinois, actually lessens Fillmore's chance of becoming president. Suppose Buchanan gets all of the slave states and Pennsylvania and any other one state besides, then he is elected no matter who gets all the rest. But suppose, Lincoln pointed out, Fillmore gets the two slave states of Maryland and Kentucky. Then Buchanan is not elected. Fillmore goes into the House of Representatives and may be made president by a compromise. But suppose again, Fillmore's friends throw away a few thousand votes on him in Indiana and Illinois. It will inevitably give these states to Buchanan, which will more than compensate him for the loss of Maryland and Kentucky. It will elect him and leave Fillmore no chance in the House of Representatives or out of it of becoming president. 
This is, Lincoln said, as plain as adding up the weights of three small hogs. As Mr. Fillmore has no possible chance to carry Illinois for himself, it is plainly his interest to let Fremont take it, and thus keep it out of the hands of Buchanan. Be not deceived. Buchanan is the hard horse to beat in this race. Let him have Illinois, and nothing can beat him. And he will get Illinois if men persist in throwing away votes upon Mr. Fillmore. Do think these things over and then act according to your judgment. Yours very truly, Abraham Lincoln. A fascinating argument. Did it work? Well, copies of the letter were mailed out by Lincoln when he sent it to one Fillmore supporter, John Kirkpatrick of Logan County, Illinois. He published the letter in the Logan County Democrat, and it was widely copied in the opposition press. After all, here is this Fremont supporter, technically telling people how they could best get Fillmore into the White House. Still, it was a noble attempt, but Lincoln's letters didn't work, and in 1856, Fillmore would get as many as 15% of the vote in Illinois, and that was well more than the 4% difference between Fremont and Buchanan, and Buchanan carried Illinois, and the election of 1856. No doubt, Fillmore was a spoiler. If Fillmore votes in Illinois and Pennsylvania and a few other states weren't there or went to Republicans, Republicans would have won the first election in which they competed in. Henry Clay, the Kentucky statesman and former Speaker of the House who ran four times for president, might have attained the office if not for a spoiler candidate. Running on the Whig ticket in his last presidential election, his party was split between slaveholding plantation owners and abolitionist northerners. The Democrats ran the unknown James Polk, and Whigs throughout the nation thought the election was theirs. They had a famous candidate, Henry Clay, and the Democrats ran an unknown. They even got the slogan out there, who is James Knox Polk? When then-President Tyler, who was a Whig president, but one that the Whigs considered a traitor when he advocated the annexation of Texas, Polk agreed to accept Texas as a state, and Henry Clay waffled since the Republic of Texas at this point was a separate country and already allowed slavery, it was obviously going to be admitted as a slave state. Clay waffled because he didn't want to offend Southern Whigs. Because of this, the Liberty Party ended up taking about 3% of the vote in the state of New York. That put James Polk ahead of Clay in New York by less than one percentage point. He carried the state and the election of 1844. The Liberty Party was a spoiler for Henry Clay. But are all third-party candidates spoilers? Fast forward to September 1968. Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, has every disadvantage. He faces a united Republican Party under Richard Nixon. The Democratic Party has had the most disastrous nominating convention ever, that of 1968, which, with police attacking protesters outside the convention hall in Chicago. He's saddled with an unpopular war, which... He'd like to disavow in some way, but he cannot because he's concerned about losing the support of the incumbent president, Lyndon Johnson. Crime is high, the economy is suffering, and Americans disagree with the administration's foreign policy, which the vice president, Humphrey, represents. Humphrey was trailing Nixon by double digits, and the old base of support the Democrats could rely on, the solid South, was gone. Angry about civil rights, key deep South states voted against the Democrats in the last election of 1964. Yet help came in a surprising form. The governor of Alabama, George Wallace, entered the election as an independent. At first, Wallace damaged Humphrey somewhat by taking away Democratic Union voters. But Wallace also interrupted Nixon, who was attempting a Southern strategy and trying to win over formerly Democratic Southern states. In effect, Wallace split the conservative vote that Nixon was targeting and boosted Humphrey's chances. The election on November 5th was a far cry from the polls of August. It proved to be extremely close, and it wasn't until the following morning that television news networks were able to call the election for Richard Nixon. The key states that carried Nixon into the White House, California, Ohio, and Illinois, were states that Nixon won by three percentage points or less. The renegade campaign of George Wallace, who sought to defeat Hubert Humphrey, actually turned out being a helper for him, though not enough to win. 
In the 1924 election of Calvin Coolidge, who had assumed the presidency after Warren Harding's death, another type of three-way race was seen. This was the year the Democrats had met in Madison Square Garden and battled each other relentlessly with the forces of William Gibbs, McAdoo, controlling the South and West, and the Tammany Hall and Eastern Bloc of Al Smith battling for the Democratic Party nomination. They conducted 104 embarrassing ballots, all carried live on radio. After days, they settled on John W. Davis, Wall Street lawyer, who nobody disliked enough not to vote for, but he certainly didn't inspire anyone. Progressive Senator Robert La Follette of Wisconsin entered the 1924 race and ended up getting 16% of the vote. But since John W. Davis and the Democrats could only scare up 26% of the vote, most of that in the South, the combined votes earned by La Follette, the Progressive, and Davis, the Democrat, turned out to be 42%, not even close to Calvin Coolidge's 54%. So La Follette, in the end, did not spoil, nor did he help the incumbent. He had no impact on the race. He just didn't matter. Same was true of General James B. Weaver, who ran on the populist ticket in 1892. Democrats and Republicans supported hard money, and the populists supported silver coinage, among other issues. Democratic former president and challenger now, Grover Cleveland, decisively defeated the incumbent president, Benjamin Harrison. Weaver was a non-factor. So from the point of view of the incumbent party, is a third-party candidate a spoiler? So, looking at it from the point of view of the incumbent party, in a three-way race, will a third-party candidate be a spoiler? Will they be a helper? Or will they not matter at all? Sometimes it's very hard to tell, as in the controversial three-way elections of 1992 and 2000. Let's look at 1992. Many Republicans feel that the entry of billionaire Ross Perot was the factor that prevented George Bush from being reelected, And this factor may have led to increased animosity towards Bill Clinton, who Republican partisans saw as a usurper through the throne. The interesting thing is that the Clinton campaign certainly didn't see things this way, especially in early 1992. With Perot in the race, Clinton was winning a Democratic nomination that increasingly didn't matter. What's the point of winning the Democratic nomination just to be in third? People seem to be more interested in this exciting businessman as president in a time when they saw both the Democrats and the president as leading to the economic situation and the recession they were in. The impulse towards business leaders to fix the problem was so strong that Clinton, and this is a little-known fact, actually considered John Scully, the president and CEO of Apple Computer, as his running mate in order to get some attention. And legitimately, it was a person that he respected. In this atmosphere, this attention on business people is is solving the problems and not a candidate of the major parties. Normally, a challenger running against an incumbent gets a big run-up, a time to tell their story. Clinton didn't get this. The fledging Perot campaign, which existed up until July, in a campaign memo, said, We must recognize Clinton for what he is, our main competitor in the race. Campaign strategists for Perot specifically mentioned the all-important Reagan Democrats as people they would be competing with Clinton for as targets in the race. And on the other side, Stan Greenberg, Clinton's pollster, wanted to compare Ross Perot presidency to Nixon's in order to steal his thunder and to get the image out there of Perot as a dictator. These two campaigns may have had the same opponent, but they were not chummy. Had Perot stayed in the race in 1992, he might have continued to drown out Clinton, and it's anybody's guess who would have won the three-way, but Perot certainly had the momentum and the resources to run a meaningful 50-state campaign and certainly could have carried 92. When later in the year Perot became pressured by his volunteers to re-enter the race, both Democrats and Republicans sent delegations to talk to him. Lloyd Benson and Verdon Jordan, who knew Perot, acted as Clinton's delegation, and they expressly asked Perot not to re-enter the race. According to Perot's supporters, Republicans were not as anxious to convince Perot not to run, though they did ask him to endorse Bush. Clinton never lost his lead in the polls to Bush even after Perot had dropped out. 
which would indicate that in a head-to-head match, Clinton would have prevailed. Indeed, Clinton's lead was as high as 50% to 39% in September. And when Perot re-entered, he started at just 2%. After appearances in the first debate, he moved to 10%. That cut Clinton's lead to a 46 to 35% lead, which was roughly coming from both Clinton and Bush. But when Perot moved from 10% to 19% in opinion polls, which was closer to the number he'd get in the election, Clinton was now down to 40, and Bush was holding at 36. Perot's late gain in the race came entirely from Clinton. As the author of Race for the Presidency 1992, Peter Goldman wrote, The race began as it started, Bush versus not Bush, with Bush losing at 60-40. The only change that occurred was when Perot entered the race, and Bush gained by sitting in place. Exit polls showed that while Perot took deep cuts into liberal and moderate Republicans, he took equal cuts into moderate and conservative Democrats. He took equal shares, exactly equal shares, of moderate, liberal, and conservative independents, roughly 30%. He tapped into the Republicans that Bill Clinton would have targeted, and he tapped into the Democrats that George Bush would have targeted. Despite the common refrain that Perot was a spoiler for Bush, The evidence is that that is not the case. But I'm not entirely sure that Perot was a helper for Bush either. Overall, I think despite all of the drama, one of the most dramatic third-party runs we've seen, after Perot quit the race and then came back, he became a non-factor in the race. It's possible he could have won if he had stayed in the whole time, but after quitting, he became a very dramatic sideshow in a race between an incumbent with very low approval ratings and a challenger who was able to present enough of a message of change. Perot may well have been in the end as ineffective as John Anderson, a Republican moderate who in 1980 decided Reagan was too conservative and ran his own independent campaign. He polled in the high 20s, and he scared both Carter and Reagan strategists. Carter declined to debate Anderson, fearing to give him any publicity. But at the same time, Reagan's strategist saw him as taking away moderate Republicans crucial to Reagan's victory. In the end, Anderson got 7% of the vote, probably hurt Carter a bit more, exaggerating Carter's electoral college loss and adding to the Reagan juggernaut. But in true electoral terms, his presence didn't matter. He was a non-factor. Out of the race, Carter might have gained a few more states but still lost the election. Now on to one of the most recent controversial three-way elections if we can even call it that, that of 2000. And a look at the question, did Green Party candidate Ralph Nader cost Al Gore the presidency? Simply, very simply said, he did. If a man named Ralph Nader was not born, and if he didn't become an activist and become famous, or if he just didn't run for president, then Al Gore would have won both New Hampshire and Florida and the election. After all, in Florida... Ralph Nader received some 97,000 votes, and Gore's official margin of loss was just 546. So, yes, Ralph Nader cost Al Gore the election. Nader was a spoiler in that very simple analysis. But the 2000 election is obviously a very difficult one to parse, and there's four factors that I think one should consider just to get a little bit broader perspective on the question. And the first is, with an unofficial margin of 546 votes, the election could just as easily be blamed on anything. I mean, a little rain in one city could have dampened turnout to affect that type of a vote. And just as Nader could have been said to have have cost Al Gore the election, so did the Workers' World Party with nearly 1,800 votes, or the Socialist Party with over 600. Secondly, it's not clear at all that 546 votes was the real margin. It's just simply the official margin that the state sent to the Electoral College. 546 votes represent a near statistical impossibility between two candidates earning 2.9 million votes each. Obviously, there were numerous problems with the 2000 election. Not only were they the undervotes, but there were 100,000 overvotes that were not counted, many in the Miami area. Then, of course, there was the butterfly ballot, which gave Pat Buchanan votes in Palm Beach he didn't even think were his. Third, 200,000 Florida Democrats, nearly 12% of all Florida Democrats, voted for George Bush. 
If just 1% would have voted the other way, Al Gore would have been president. In a consideration of who's the spoiler, we could say Nader's a spoiler, but these Democrats could be considered just as much as a spoiler factor as Nader voters were. Something else to consider. Many of these Nader voters might not have voted for at all. Obviously, they weren't impressed with either party candidate. It's possible they would have stayed home. And that brings up another factor with three-way elections. The presence of a three-way election in American politics seems to be at least correlated, associated with a slight increase in turnout. It's, it's hard to make a statement about this because the turnout in American elections can also boost in two-way races, such as it did in 2004 when the percentage of voting age population who showed up to the polls was near 56%. But the three-way elections of 1992, 1968, 1948, 1856, and 1844 did see boosts in turnout, however slight. Although the elections of 2000 and 1980 and 1892 saw no increase or negligible increase in the vote. Overall, there's some evidence that the presence of a third party on the ticket can add some new excitement and new voters, and thus, perhaps no one will be helped or spoiled. Now, to the question as to whether Mayor Mike Bloomberg could be a spoiler to the incumbent Republicans and their candidate, a helper to them, or a non-factor, It would appear to me it depends who's nominated on either side. If it's Senator Hillary Clinton as the Democratic nominee, then I believe Bloomberg's presence in the ticket could be as a helper to the Republicans, as he would, first of all, make Hillary Clinton fight to some extent for New York, but not without complications. If Republicans nominate a candidate who's unacceptable to New York, which may be anyone currently running for the GOP nomination besides Rudy, I don't think there will be enough Bloomberg votes in New York to boost the Republican candidate there. If the Republicans do nominate Rudy Giuliani, Bloomberg might steal some city votes from Hillary Clinton, but he also might steal some suburban votes from Giuliani. After all, suburban New Yorkers tend to be commuters, and they're familiar both with Giuliani and Bloomberg as the mayor of where they work. The only evidence we have of this effect is that in New Jersey polls, currently, Senator Hillary Clinton is the winner in the three-way matchup because Bloomberg's pulling more from Giuliani. So if Bloomberg enters the race and Rudy Giuliani runs, in a sense, Bloomberg may steal away the main advantages Republicans would get from a Giuliani run, and that is a GOP candidate who could possibly be competitive in the northeast states of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. On the other hand, Bloomberg can do damage to Senator Clinton in Florida, Wisconsin, possibly Minnesota, and perhaps some other states. And if Bloomberg really scores well, you might see states like a, a state like California be in jeopardy. But if Republicans nominate someone who's too conservative, it's, it's clear that Bloomberg may steal some moderate business oriented Republicans who are not necessarily socially conservative, in certain other states, and maybe change the electoral calculus. Could North Carolina, Nevada, and Arizona, states that are already going to be targeted by Democrats, now end up in the map? Another factor to consider, the two major issues that we might see in the 2008 election, that of immigration and that of the rising Hispanic vote, which is increasingly going Democratic, and that of the war in Iraq, are two issues where Bloomberg really doesn't have any advantage over the Democratic candidate. Like so many things, the question of the impact of Mayor Michael Bloomberg in a possible three-way 2008 presidential race cannot be answered immediately by history. But I hope that this look at other American three-way races has broadened your perspective, whether Bloomberg could be a spoiler, a helper, or not a factor at all. With history beating up politics, I'm Bruce Carlson.